Professor Kirk Phillips, Professor of Economics at BYU, uh, received his PhD from the University of Rochester in 1991. Uh, he was a undergraduate economics and Asian studies major and graduated from BYU in 1986. Uh, current areas of interest and in research include international finance, economic growth, uh, macroeconomics, and some research into Asian economics. Uh, we are very pleased to have him uh, here with us today, and if you'd please welcome Professor Kirk Phillips. Thank you. I'm not used to these formal type presentations here, so you have to bear with me. Uh, I chose to talk when they asked me about uh, something I could present to talk about uh, Korean reunification. So here is the uh, really cool multimedia presentation that I put together all by myself. So, um, Economic models of Korean reunification. And I want to sort of uh, spin the talk here. Uh, I don't want to give a talk that, like I would give to my economics colleagues. So my hope is, here is that I can talk to you about uh, insights into the economic impacts of reunification without uh, relying too much on a lot of economic jargon. So I'm hoping what I can do is uh, give you the intuition behind the economic modeling, but I, I guarantee that at some point in the lecture I'll slip into economies or something and try to write an equation up on the chalkboard that's not here, and I apologize for that sort of stuff in advance. Okay. Um, so Korean unification, at the time they asked me uh, uh, last uh, fall, uh, things actually looked pretty nice, and then uh, they discovered uh, a nuclear processing facility or uh, enrichment, uranium enrichment uh, program going on in North Korea, and things have been a little bit downhill since then, to put things mildly. So it doesn't really seem likely anytime soon. Maybe this is not such a pressing issue. Um, nonetheless, uh, I think if you were to talk to Koreans uh, on, on both sides of the, of the uh, demilitarized zone, uh, there's a lot of desire there for reunification. Uh, there's this feeling that the country was torn apart uh, against their wishes by uh, uh, the Japanese, well, not so much by the Japanese, but the U.S. and the, the Russians by the Allied forces when they came in and reoccupied the country at the end of World War II. And most people would really like to have reunification. The question is, how do you go about doing it? And most people don't, in South Korea, don't want reunification if that means the North invades and reunifies that way. That's sort of an unacceptable sort of reunification method. Uh, the two governments, uh, for uh, other reasons, don't bear to be quite so excited about this as uh, the people themselves are. Uh, maybe that's because uh, people can have dreams and aspirations and not have to worry about the nitty-gritty details of how you're actually going to accomplish this, and the governments are stuck with that job. And, uh, uh, in any case, uh, thesis for the talk. Suppose that you actually could uh, achieve uh, reunification between North and South Korea. Uh, what I want to look at is what would some of the effects be in terms of the economics. Uh, so let's look at uh, the effects on uh, things like wages of Korean workers or uh, returns on uh, Korean capital, things like that. Uh, which bi not say that's which businesses, but businesses in general would they tend to prosper or be hurt by this? Um, so who are the parties that would gain? Uh, who are the parties that would lose from reunification? And are they the same on both sides of the border? And I think this is a useful exercise, even if you don't think reunification is likely to occur anytime soon, uh, because at least gives you some feel for who are the parties that are going to be lobbying for or against, who are the people that are going to be really pushing heavily for reunification, and who would you expect to be sort of uh, the people blocking it or trying to uh, slow things down. Um, Obviously, it matters how it occurs. A uh, possible scenario here is the North invades and occupies the South. Compare that with some sort of uh, a two systems, a sort of uh, uh, PRC Hong Kong type of a system, right, where you actually have one country, but you may have two, two separate governments that are running the North versus the South with some sort of liberalization in terms of uh, uh, trade in uh, goods and services or factors of production or something. Obviously, uh, you know, the results of those two things are going to matter because we know that uh, the types of legal systems that are put in place can have a really big impact on 
what the economy turns out to look like. Okay. Um, another possibility, uh, which is the one that people seem to, to focus the most on, is, well, the North Korean government is just going to cave in, it's going to fall apart, and we're going to end up with uh, uh, the East Germany scenario. Uh, so you, you can imagine uh, very different outcomes to each of those three. Okay. Uh, so let me just sort of start off uh, thinking about what are the three major effects that I could identify right off the bat that seem sort of the, the obvious effects of reunification uh, or integration, however you want to think about this, uh, allowing North Koreans some, and South Koreans some sort of contact, some sort of economic contact with each other. Okay. Um, first one, which, I mean, these may feel, all be sort of fairly obvious. The first one is uh, there's a lot of money being spent on both sides of the, of the border, and it's not just money. There's a lot of manpower uh, and a lot of other resources that get redirected towards defense. And if you could have some sort of reunification, so you had a single government or some sort of benign type of integration, uh, you wouldn't need all those people uh, that are basically providing defense against the other half of the country. So you're going to free up a lot of resources uh, through integration. And it turns out the resources that you free up here are very significant. It's a huge effect, particularly in the north, uh, that you can get from simply being able to downsize the military through uh, reunification. Uh, the other one is, of course, North Korea along with uh, Cuba and uh, maybe a couple other places in the world, Laos maybe, are one of the few places left where there's really rigid state control over the way the, the, the factors of production are utilized. So uh, capital is controlled by the state and labor is controlled by the state. And uh, past history has shown that that's a fairly uh, um, inefficient, that's the word I'm looking for, inefficient way of allocating these resources. So there's another big effect here that would come, it doesn't necessarily have to occur because of re, uh, reunification, uh, but if you could somehow get the North to uh, adopt some sort of a market system, uh, that would be an improvement over what they've got now. Uh, and it's likely to be a very market improvement, okay, if you believe the experiences uh, of uh, uh, Eastern European countries like Poland and Czechoslovakia and, and even places like Russia, where the, the transition's been a little bit rougher, uh, you wait long enough, uh, a transition to a market type system seems to pay off. So that's another big effect. And then the last one is gains from trade. And this is what I'll spend most of my time talking about here is what do these gains from trade look like? Um, allowing the, these two countries that have uh, very different sorts of allocations of resources to trade with each other. Okay. Now this, this to take a stab at the defense numbers here. Uh, in North Korea there are approximately a million men under arms in, nor in the north. Okay. Uh, that's a population of around 20 million, so that's uh, 4 to 5 percent of the total population. It's really difficult to get reliable numbers on anything happening in North Korea. So these are, you know, ballpark figures, plus or minus 50 percent or something like that. They're probably not that bad. Uh, but, you know, take them with a, with a grain of salt. So these are really rough numbers. But about a million people under arms, okay? Not all of them on the demilitarized zone, but a fair number of those, okay? Uh, when you start looking at it other ways, so that's, uh, it's only 4 to 5 percent of the population, but it's about one-fifth of all the working age males in uh, North Korea are uh, engaged in the military. Uh, so suppose uh, it's five and a half billion dollars U.S. adjusted appropriately, and about uh, 31 percent of the total output in North Korea is uh, spent on military production. Okay, so that's a lot of resources going to the military. Uh, suppose you could take these guys and simply reallocate them, maybe not all one million of them, but suppose you could get them out of providing national defense and have them do other things. Now, you need to be careful about that, too, because a lot of what gets produced in North Korea actually gets produced by soldiers. Right? So, uh, again, we're playing with the numbers here, but uh, uh, it's a really loose exercise, and I don't want you to take this as you know, uh, some hard and fast prediction of what would happen. This is just uh, try to get some feel for what happens if you could reallocate those people. Okay. Uh, compare that to South Korea, about three quarters of a million people under arms in South Korea. It's got a larger population, about twice the size. So it's only about uh, one to two percent of the total population and about seven percent of the working age males. Uh, they spent twelve point eight billion uh, dollars on defense, which is a larger amount in the north, but it's uh, you know ten times smaller in terms of uh, 
the total amount of GDP that's produced in the South. Okay, so it's a much smaller uh, defense burden in percentage terms being imposed by the South. Well, suppose you could just somehow, I mean, and, and the two-thirds here is just a number out of a hat, but suppose you could, by reunifying, reduce the military by a factor of you know, two-thirds, only have a third of the people. Uh, you're going to free up that many people in the two countries, okay? Uh, then take those people and assume, I and mean, this is really rough, assume you could take those set of people and just reassign them to different jobs uh, uh, in the uh, in the, the private sector, uh, if North Korea can be said to have a private sector, in the non-military sector, okay? Uh, and suppose they were just as productive as the existing workers that are already there, okay? So what does that do? Uh, well, you're going to get uh, $1.5 billion per year more in North Korea and $19.6 billion more in South Korea with the appropriate percentages there. And that's a pretty ju big jump there, all right, uh, in, in North Korea. 7% more would be produced if you could simply take the military and somehow reassign them. And didn't have to worry about having them sit there pointing their guns at the other guys, right? Because you're not really being too economically pr uh, productive. I mean, they're, they're certainly providing a service, right? Um, uh, national defense is something that both of these countries want. Neither of them wants to be invaded. But if you could somehow reduce that threat of invasion, then you can take those uh, people and, and use them a little bit more efficiently, use them to do other things, stuff that's uh, not needed anymore. Uh, so another question here, I just tried this one. Suppose you could take the same number of people, but by uh, through reunifying here, you could reallocate these guys, and suppose you gave them the same labor productivity that South Korean workers have on average. Okay? What do you get uh, if you reallocate that same number of people? A little bit over a million people out of uh, military and into uh, production, you'd produce $45.8 billion more per year if you could do that. And that's uh, twice the current output of North Korea, okay, simply by taking those workers and making them produce in, in a way that's roughly as efficient as they are in South Korea. So, I mean, that's a, that's a big gain. And there's no doubt that uh, one of the big gains that you'll observe from reunification, if it ever happens, is going to be this loss of the military burden, right? the peace dividend, so to speak. Okay. Well, uh, going back, I mean, if you, well, the assumption from that last little exercise is that we could somehow be more efficient with these workers than they currently are in the North. So um, let's just take a look at what market efficiency looks like. Uh, North Korea's got a level of GDP, $21 billion. This, this is all uh, adjusted into U.S. dollars. Um, we can talk about the way it's adjusted later if you really want to know. But it's a rough measure. Uh, labor force is about 9.6, so about half the population is considered in the labor force. And uh, the productivity in the North is about $2,300 per worker. It's not per family uh, or per person. It's per worker. Okay, so each worker produces about $2,300 per year. If you take the goods and services and you value those goods and services at international prices, that's what they're worth on average. Uh, look, take a look at South Korea. Uh, there's the difference. Forty times the, the, the real value of production in South Korea. The labor force is a little bit over twice as big, uh, but even allowing for the fact that they've got a larger labor force, there's still 40 times uh, as much stuff being produced. And so the pro productivity there is close to 20 percent. Right? So the average worker, again, this is not per capita income, this is average worker produces about $40,000 worth of output in a year's time in South Korea. Okay. So these are huge, huge differences in terms of the efficiency levels. Even if you think that the numbers up here aren't really good, because they aren't, uh, suppose we've underestimated these grossly and, and they're, the real true values are three times larger. Right, uh, then South Korea is still 12 to 15 times uh, more productive, right? Or in terms of the total GDP, and they're, you know, seven or eight times more productive per worker. So there's a big difference between these two. Okay. Uh, go through the same types of exercises here. Suppose you could take the North and give them the same production techniques as the South. These are some really strong assumptions here. Okay, so the, 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 the experiment here. It's a very unrealistic one, which is just reunify the country, and all of a sudden all the workers in North Korea are exactly as productive as, as the average worker in South Korea. What's that going to look like? Okay. Uh, so we have to assume they have the same production techniques, 
Uh, they attract the same amount of capital per worker. That's debatable. Uh, and that the total output doesn't depend very heavily upon stuff like land or uh, presence of minerals or things that uh, are very specific to North Korea and South Korea, sort of uh, uh, place-specific types of things. Okay? So assume all those things away, which we economists are really good at doing. Just assume them away because it's easier to get the answer if we assume them away. Uh, what do we get? Uh, GDP in North Korea is, of course, obviously going to be 17 times higher. That's $377 billion. And uh, what they were producing today is roughly $30 billion. Right? And uh, for the whole peninsula, that's a 40% increase in GDP that would occur under those assumptions virtually overnight, simply by being able to reunify. Assuming that you could translate those uh, productivity gains over to North Korea. Okay. All right, look at this third category, which is these gains. Uh, uh, well, I haven't quite got to it yet, but uh, what's the problem with what we just did? The problem is that we've got these immobile factors that we said that aren't really the same in both, both parts of Korea. So let's take a look at these. That, that little exercise we just uh, went through is not accurate, right? The, the assumptions were unrealistic. So what's going on here? Why isn't it uh, realistic? Well, we've got lots of... Uh, these factors that you can't move. So the mineral resources are relatively plentiful in the north, at least compared to South Korea. All right, South Korea, you can mine a little bit of coal, coal dust, and that's about it. Okay? But in North Korea, you can get all sorts of, uh, of metals, uh, as well as access to coal and other types of, uh, of uh, things from mining. Okay? Uh, there's a lot more sites to build uh, hydroelectric power, uh, hydroelectric dams in the north. Right? than there are in the south, because it's much more mountainous. Uh, on the other hand, in the south, there's a lot more arable land. And uh, there's, uh, I don't know if you want to think of this as an immobile factor, but certainly at the current time, uh, it's immobile. You can't, you know, you know if uh, people try to move from North Korea to South Korea or South Korea to North Korea, they tend to get shot. Uh, so that's it's a, sort of a tendency towards immobility there. Uh, there's a lot more educated and skilled workers in the south. Okay. Not to say that North Korean workers are necessarily uneducated, but they're not educated, those that are, in the right types of things, right, uh, that are going to pay off in the marketplace, at least. Okay. Uh, so think about different types of integration. I'm going to go through two exercises. First one we can look at is a free trade zone. A uh, free trade zone is just defined as a, an arrangement where you allow goods and services to move freely across the border. Obviously, that's not happening now between North and South Korea. Um, capital is also allowed to move freely across the border. It's not necessarily in the definition of a free trade zone, but I want to include it in the exercise I'm going through because that's certainly the case in South Korea right now uh, where foreign capital is allowed in and there's not really a whole lot of restrictions. Right? And Koreans nowadays are allowed to uh, invest in overseas ventures if they want to. Okay? Uh, but a free trade zone doesn't allow the, mo the labor to move around. Okay, so uh, the United States, uh, Canada, and Mexico have a free trade arrangement. If we're in a free trade zone, but that doesn't mean that we allow Mexican workers to come in unrestricted into the United States. So that's one uh, example there. And then, of course, we've got this problem. We've got land and similar other types of resources that can't move. It's, it's impossible for them to move. Or, or it's very costly. I mean, you can't imagine picking up a dairy farm and moving it across the border. Well, you could imagine it, but it's not going to happen. If you can't imagine it, then you're not very, you know, imaginative, I guess. Uh, so let me look at the second one, which is a common market. And the only difference between a common market and a free trade zone is that a common market allows all the factors to move freely. Okay, so I want to look at these two different experiments, so to speak, and just sort of think about what's the differences between these. And you can imagine these as various types of, uh, of integration that we, uh, we sort of talked about previously, right? If you had uh, some sort of this, this uh, um, reform in North Korea where they sort of signed a real peace treaty and they agreed to uh, uh, let goods and services flow across the borders, it's still unlikely that you're going to allow the, the, the workers to move freely across the borders. So that's the case uh, uh, in China and Hong Kong, for example, where the workers aren't allowed unrestricted movement across the borders. Okay? So suppose you had the same type of thing in North Korea. That's going to be the free trade zone. And then imagine reunification, complete reunification under a single government as being something like this. Okay? Well, fortunately, uh, a lot of economists before me have worked on these issues in sort of a general sense, that we've worked through the trade theory that applies to 
common markets and free trade zones. So I'm just going to want to interpret this in the context of some of those models. Okay. So let me talk about uh, the, this is the basic workhorse model. It's known as the Hechtrolein model. And any of you have had to sit through my 257 class had to learn this thing, whether you wanted to or not. This is the uh, most commonly used model in international economics to try and explain why trade occurs. Uh, some basic assumptions here, just to keep things simple. Two goods, two factors, two countries. And there's the interpretation I sort of want to lay on this in terms of North and South Korea. Uh, identical preferences, so we don't have any differences in terms of North Koreans' desire to consume a different bundle of goods and South Koreans have desires for uh, some other bundle. Okay. Uh, access to the exact same technology, and this may be unrealistic, but that's what the model assumes. So let's just take a look at it as a first stab. And then different factor endowments. So uh, since these two things are the same, the only thing that's going to cause any gains from trade in this, in this workhorse model here is they've got to have some differences in the factor endowments. Okay. And the differences we want to assume is that the South has got relatively large amount of capital, at least relative to the North. That seems uh, to be uh, true. And North is relatively labor abundant, with the emphasis here being on relatively. Okay? North Korea's got fewer people, but uh, they, they've got a lot more workers per unit of capital because they just don't have a whole lot of capital there. Okay? So uh, in terms of the endowments of either labor or capital, they look rel relatively labor abundant even though they're small relative to the South. What does a free trade give you, area give you? Okay, so this is the first uh, e experiment here. Well, before reform, what you should observe here, uh, this is how I want to set it up. So before reform, before you actually impose the free trade area here, South is open to trade in goods and capital. Okay, that's sort of the status quo, and the North is basically close to trade in anything. Okay, um, so that's what we're going to start off with. And then suppose you start off from, from this uh, baseline and think about, let's move to a free trade area. What's the results? Okay, so after the reform, you're going to observe the North opening up to trades in good and capital. What's the result? No change in the South. Okay. Uh, it makes absolutely no difference under this particular model to people in South Korea whether they reunify or not if the sexual lean model is an accurate description. And that's a little bit counterintuitive because most people would look at this and go, wow, there ought to be some really big gains. Okay? So what's going on here? Well, the way this works is basically the return on capital is set by the world market because Korea is, South Korea is opened up to the world market. And uh, the capital is just sort of flowing in. There's a world interest rate. And Korea has uh, got opportunities for investment in capital. And what's going to happen is that uh, capital is going to flow into Korea until the... Uh, return on those investments is exactly equal to what it would be anywhere else in the world, anywhere else in the world that's got free access to capital. Okay? So, so the amount of capital in South Korea is just set by whatever the world interest rate happens to be. And by opening up North Korea to, uh, to the, the markets, to the world markets, you don't change any of that. Okay? So there's no change in the, in the amount of capital in North Korea. If there's no change in uh, the amount of capital, Right, the same amount of capital, then workers are going to have the same wages that they would otherwise because there's the same amount of capital per worker. And what tends to drive increases in wages is either lots of capital per worker or dramatic increases in technology. Okay? And what we're looking at here is a case where there's no additional capital per worker and the free trade area opening up to free trade by itself isn't going to do anything in terms of giving people better technology in the South. Okay, so the net result of this is just nothing happens in the South. Okay? But there's radical stuff going on in the North because it's the North that's changing. So North Korea doesn't allow access currently to anybody. Foreign investment's uh, basically not allowed with, with some very, very, very minor exceptions. Okay? So if you were to open this up, you'd get lots of capital flowing in, presumably. There's lots of workers in North Korea that could be a lot more productive if they simply had more capital to work with. Okay, so you get capital inflows. Uh, the returns to the pre-existing capital is going to fall. Okay? So there is some capital in North Korea. Presumably that capital, if it were being utilized properly, and that's, uh, that's uh, debatable, but if this capital were being utilized according to some sort of me measure of efficiency, uh, then what would be happening here is that capital would be really, really valuable 
All right. So starting from that baseline, what would happen is you'd tend to see the return on that capital fall. All right. It's not going to be as productive because now there's more of this stuff that's competing with other capital that's come in from overseas. Okay. Um, so what you would observe then, presumably, is a rise in the wages because you've got greater uh, labor productivity per worker. And the owners of the capital are going to be worse off because uh, there's this fall, this drop in uh, the returns to capital. Okay. Um, well, the, the question raised, the, you immediately raised is who are the owners of capital in North Korea? Presumably it's, it's the, the people, right? Uh, as a practical matter, I don't know who actually owns the capital in North Korea, who's managing it. Currently, maybe you would, it's best to say that really nobody's managing it or it's being managed very poorly. Okay? Uh, but this is what the model, what a Hexerolene model would predict. Okay? And uh, so you get the, these bottom line results is that the owners of capital would be generally better off, the worker, uh, worse off, and the, and the workers would generally be better off as a result of a free trade area. Okay. Okay. And, and then the finally here, when you look at these two countries, you ought to get the return on capital end up being the same in both regions. Uh, wages should end up being the same in both regions. This is a standard result from a Hexerolean model uh, if you really have free trade. Uh, so what this would be saying is uh, a free trade area, if, this, if the assumptions under this model are right, a free trade area is going to give North Korean workers the same wages that South Korean workers currently enjoy. That's the end result. Okay. Um, what does a common market do? Uh, a common market gives you the exact same results. There's no difference. So allowing uh, the workers to move across the border in, in a hexually model makes absolutely no difference, basically. Okay. Uh, because there's this well-known result that uh, trade in goods is a perfect substitute for trade in factors in this particular model. Okay. So we use this basic workhorse model, Hexerolene model, to make some predictions about what's going to happen in, in North Korea. Uh, well, there's some problems with this. Okay. First problem is that southern residents should basically just be indifferent. They shouldn't care whether they, they get any sort of reunification or not, at least not in economic terms. Right. Uh, so the status quo is just as fine as being reunified in terms of the economics. So what do you actually observe? Well, if you talk to people, uh, workers or residents from South Korea, you sort of end up, uh, they've got sort of two minds here. They're somewhat ambivalent about this. I mean, they, they almost always say, yes, we need to reunify. We really need to reunify. But if you start pushing them on them and say, okay, well, you know, have you thought this through? What's going to happen when you reunify? Uh, are you really in favor of reunification? Then they get, start getting a little bit ambivalent. Well, we want to reunify as long as such and such and such happens. Okay? As near as I can see what goes on here is there's two things. The first one is there's this patriotic desire to reunify. And you don't want to downplay that. That's a really, really important part of what's driving uh, the, the process, of, of the, as slow as it may be, towards reunification between these two uh, different parts of Korea. But there's also these worries uh, that occasionally people express here about, you know, am I going to have to compete with these, uh, these northern workers who have really low wages and are really work, will, uh, willing to work really cheap, you know? Am I going to lose my job uh, if we reunify with North Korea because they can hire a North Korean to do exactly the same thing at, you know, one-third the cost, one-third the wages is what, of what I'm making. So there's this little bit of this ambivalence. And the model here says... They shouldn't care. Shouldn't make any difference. Okay. So what's wrong? Well, first of all, obviously, the workers aren't identical. Okay. So workers in these two different parts of the country have different skills. Right. Um, uh, some of those skills are acquired. Some of these skills are things like the levels of health. Right. I mean, we know that there uh, is at least a certain segment in North Korea that's got really bad health problems because they're starving. Okay. They're not nearly as productive. It's hard to work when you're starving. Um, it's even hard enough to work when you're dieting. I know that. Okay. Um, some goods require different types of inputs uh, uh, from different worker skills. Okay. So there may be some goods that could be re produced really good in North Korea and other goods that could be produced much more uh, efficiently in South Korea because of the, the skill mix of the, of the workers that you observe. Okay. Uh, so th what this moves us towards is a different model, which was known as the specific factors model. Uh, and to run through this one, it's basically the same as the Hexerolene model. I'm just going to put all these up here. Um, two goods, but we assume three factors here. 
capital, which like the other model can be used for both goods, but think now about having two different types of labor, skilled labor and unskilled labor. And I don't want to sort of imply, you know, some sort of value on here. It's just a, it's an easy label, okay? So skilled workers are people that have the ability to produce manufactured goods. And I'm arguing in some sense that that may be easier than the unskilled labor that's typically used in agriculture. Any of you who are farmers, forgive me. I don't mean to imply that farmers are unskilled, okay? It's a, just a different skill mix, okay? Um, so we've got this basic setup for the model, and then we're going to assume some assumptions about these factor abundances. So we assume, again, South has got a lot of capital. It's, it's more abundant in skilled labor, and the North is more abundant in unskilled labor. Okay, so those are the assumptions. What does a free trade area get you? Okay, basically gives you the same thing as a Hecht-Rolene model. There's no change in the South for the exact same reasons as before. You should get this inflow of capital into the North. The one major difference here is that what this uh, specific factors model would predict is that even though the skilled wages, uh, uh, excuse me, skilled wages in the North should actually end up being higher than skilled wages in the South, and unskilled wages in the North should actually end up lower and then they were in the south. Okay, so under this model here, you get this uh, a different prediction, which says, you know, if I happen to be a really skilled worker living in the north, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm able to very rapidly assemble automobiles, okay, uh, because there are so few of us in, nor in, the, in North Korea, if uh, the capital flowed in and somebody set up an automobile plant, they'd be very desperate to get skilled workers, and so I'm going to get a really high wage. In fact, I'd probably get a higher wage than South Korean workers do. Right, because my skill is really, really, really uh, scarce in North Korea, whereas skilled workers are fairly uh, common in South Korea. Okay, so there's this prediction that sort of wages are going to rise, but in the North they're going to way overshoot higher than South Korea, and unskilled wages in the North are going to en end up lower than they are in the South. But they're still going to be higher than they were before reform. Okay? Uh, so that's the, the, what a free trade area gets you. What does a common market give you? Well, you get d different predictions, okay? Um, now what you're allowed to do uh, with a common market is, uh, I mean, you go back to the previous slide, there were these wage differences, right? Skilled workers were making more money in the north. Unskilled workers were making uh, uh, more money in the south, okay? Uh, and what a common market says is, well, you know, workers can move, okay? So as long as it's new, not too costly to pick up and move, uh, then what you would get is you'd get these flows, right? Skilled workers in the south would move to the north where the wages are higher. Unskilled workers from the north would move to the south. Uh, and what does that end up doing in the end? Okay. Um, return on capital ends up the same in both, uh, both regions. Skilled and un unskilled wages end up the same in both regions. And you basically end up with this big integrated economy. Okay. So that's the results. Uh, and the skilled workers in the South are going to end up having higher wages uh, than they did before the reform, okay, because of this uh, uh, movement in the, in the skilled uh, workers, and unskilled wages are going to end up having lower wages than they had to reform, reform. Okay, so think of this then, <clears throat> excuse me, think of this from the point of view if you happen to be living in South Korea. Are you in favor of reunification or are you opposed to it, all right? Well, it depends upon whether you consider yourself skilled or unskilled, or it depends upon which sector are you working in, right? These are manufactured workers. These are agricultural workers, according to this very simple model that we've built, okay? Or uh, if you want to think about lots of goods, then there are goods that are produced using skilled labor primarily, and then there are goods that are used producing unskilled labor primarily. Uh, uh, which of these industries do you work in, right? And if you happen to work in an industry that you think uh, it uses lots of skilled workers, and you're a skilled worker, you're better off with reunification, okay? But if you're an unskilled worker, then you, you kind of look at this with a little bit of trepidation. All right, well, other problems, okay? This is, this is a simplistic model as well. There are other specific factors we could look at besides labor. Um, the various types of land that might be specific to various types of activities. We've already considered two goods. So suppose you had more goods. Uh, all that sort of stuff is going to basically give you the same flavor of the specific factors model. Okay? Uh, I don't know if we gain much more by going through the rest of these and talking about a, a more extensive model, specific, uh, uh, additionally, or specifically because when I've gone through this, I haven't actually figured out what the results yet are yet.
got a paper in progress on this, but it's not done yet. So. Uh, but what, what, we, what you'd expect from this is basically the same type of a flavor. Okay? Uh, if you've got other specific factors that aren't, uh, uh, aren't mobile across sectors that can't be used in the production of other goods, then you're going to end up with, you know, land returns are going to have effects, right? So uh, they're, they're going to be returns on land, and landowners may or may not be in favor of, of reunification depending upon whether the stuff that's produced with their land happens to be agriculture or something else, right? Uh, it's something that's relatively scarce in the South as opposed to something that's rel relatively abundant in the South. Uh, that's probably enough, at least to, that's probably actually too much in terms of getting started. Um, are there questions? I, that's why I intended to spend most of the time doing was answering questions, but, yeah. You emphasize the long run and the big build in the long run. Yeah. In the short run, what are some of the repercussions? Um, because we, with all the different models we've seen, yes, there's the goals and this is what will end up, or possibly end up, but in the short run, Right. Well, in, in, the, in the short, see, the assumption here is that uh, when we when we did this, these models are all static models. So it's like saying, okay, there's this snapshot of the world. This is what the world the world never changes, and now, boom, here's a different world. Okay. So there's a transition between these two that we've we've uh, implicitly been ignoring. Okay. And there are transitions, right? I mean, they, they should be fairly obvious. Which is, you, know, you have to have workers move, the capital has to flow in. Okay. And depending upon how long that takes, you could have large changes, right? Uh, and I think you have to sort of think about what's causing it, what's inducing people to move, right? So if you're in South Korea, the reason that the, you want to get the skilled workers to move to the, to the north is because the higher wages there and lower ones in the south. And unskilled workers, it's the same thing, right? So in the transition, you've got this period where wages for unskilled workers are going to drop in South Korea, right? And that's what's going to cause people to, to move in uh, from the north, which is still higher than what they are in the north. Uh, so what are you doing during that transition period? Right? You've got a lot of people in, in South Korea who are going to be working for less wages or presumably even be unemployed. You know, what does that period look like? And, and these models here aren't designed to answer those questions. Okay? But they're things you have to worry about, which is why I guess we pay policymakers the big bucks to worry about those things, because economists don't really... At least with these models, we don't want to worry about it. Okay. Yeah? So what's going to happen when you all of a sudden have, you know, 1 million, 2 million, 5 million people all of a sudden turn around and say, okay, we're ready to work? There's no way there's going to be that many jobs, are there? Again, it's the transition, right? Uh, I mean, what are the, what are the jobs? I mean, a job is a, a position at a... It's a traditional job in selling a position at a, at a factory or a business, right? If it's a manufacturing job, then it's fairly time-consuming, right? Because in order to get the job, you have to go in and build the plant that the people are going to work at. In the short run, you could pick up some workers by uh, utilizing the existing plants at a higher capacity, right? So you could run the plants over time. Uh, but what you really need to do is build more plants, and that's time-consuming. It takes a while to build a plant. But for services, and increasingly, uh, South Korea is much more and more uh, service-oriented than, than before. The U.S., for example, services are probably anywhere from two-thirds to three-fourths of what the U.S. produces. South Korea is probably closer to half, right? But that's still, you know, uh, a big portion of the economy in services. And services, it's, it's fairly quickly uh, you can set up the infrastructure you need for services. Uh, the question still remains, you know, what, what are you going to have them do? Uh, and I don't know what the answer to that is. Uh, that's up to, you know, entrepreneurs, people in North and South Korea who see business making opportunities to so, so go in and sort of identify, you know, I, you know, I'd really like to do this. I could do this if I had the workers. Uh, why don't I hire some? All right. And it's very difficult to, for anybody uh, ex ante to try and predict what those opportunities are going to look like. Some of them are just unpredictable. Right? Well, just a, a comment about that and then a question that, Having lived in Korea, um, as you said earlier, that a lot of the soldiers do those those services as it is. If those were turned over to the private sector, you could very quickly employ a lot of those those soldiers because they're already doing services. You just need to pay them in the private sector. Right, right? you can pay them private sector wages. Right. Right. And then my question is: is as we saw with the the West Germany East Germany uh, unification, who would Korea North Korea be able to pay any of the burden of of upgrading their technology at all, or would that be like how it was with 
East and West Germany where South Korea would have to really chip so, in and say we're going to sacrifice and we're going to help you to get this technology? Uh, it, it depends. I mean, it depends upon how you think te technology gets allocated, right? Technology, um, the latest technology is going to be costly, right, because people don't give that away for free. Uh, but sort of like the next best technology is generally available to almost anybody, right? So almost anybody can make nuclear bombs because that's like the next be best technology as opposed to hydrogen bombs, right? Um, so if you've got access to that, I mean, you could get a big improvement in North Korea simply off of technologies that are freely available. Um, who pays for the best technology, the cutting edge technology? It's going to be whoever you know moves in and sets up the uh, up the plant, right? They're going to have to get uh, some sort of a payment, and they're not going to go in and you're not going to go in and build a uh, uh, a chip manufacturing plant in North Korea uh, as a manufacturer unless you think you're going to get some sort of a return on that. That gets and it gets split, right? So there's a return that gets split when you produce and sell those chips. It gets split. Part of it gets paid to the workers in wages, and part of it gets paid to the manufacturer as a as a payment both for the capital and for the entrepreneurial know-how, the, the technology that they're selling as well. Right? So it's not like uh, you, you have to suddenly get this big pool of money and then we're going to go out and buy technologies that we can give to North Koreans. The businesses coming in are expecting that they're going to be compensated by operating the business for that. Yeah. Okay. Question regarding the geopolitics of Northeast Asia there, uh, this is quite different than what you've been talking about, right. but uh, I, I've had an impression, I'm not sure where this comes from, that uh, the neighbors would not be too enthused about a unification of Korea. The Japanese, for one, they would see some problems perhaps if there was a, a larger, more productive Korea looming there. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what have you gained from your reading? Uh, I'm not the expert on uh, on the on the politics of the region, right? But uh, to the extent that I mean, when, when I think about what Japanese and and to to a part, maybe a lesser extent, or maybe even a more extent, that the Chinese worry about with a unified Korea, is you've got almost two million men under arms, right? If you suddenly reunify, that's a pretty nice looking army, right? And they're no no longer facing each other, right? Uh, that might be a little bit scary, uh, but if you actually have got a reunified Korea and they're demilitarized, uh, I don't see what the threat is. I mean, I mean, the, the, the Japanese still may be scared, and the Chinese still may be frightened by the idea that there's this, uh, you know, a, a 70 million person nation there instead of two, you know, a 22 and a 45 million person nation split in half, but. As long as there's no threat to their security, I don't see why they should be too concerned about it. Right? Aggressive competition or economics. Sure, sure. And uh, uh, that's good. Right? I mean, in terms of, uh, of overall efficiency, that, that's wonderful. I mean, it's no, it's no fun to be on the losing end, but uh, uh, if, you can, if you force people to your own businesses to compete with people that are that are more competitive you make your own businesses more competitive as well you know I mean uh, that's probably the reason that uh, we still have automobile manufacturers in the US is because we forced US automobile manufacturers to pace face foreign competition so no, I mean the response may very well be uh, protectionism too right so the Japanese may decide, look, we're already a basket case. Well, you know, a unified Korea now sitting right across the strait, uh, cheap goods flowing in. Maybe the best response is let's put some walls up and uh, buy Japanese. I mean, that's another possible response. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. Paid any of the ones that uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah.
what economic issues here, but most of uh, uh, stuff I've done on the, on the political side is the North Korean government looks at the at the German reunification and they get a little bit scared. It was very costly, right? Uh, because they basically said, stepped in and said, you know, we're going to provide a level of uh, of uh, standard of living uh, for East Germans that's up to some minimum threshold of what uh, West Germans would enjoy, and that 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 in required in the transition a huge subsidy, right? So huge amounts of uh, of resources were transferred from West Germans to East Germans to sort of bring the East Germans up to this minimal sta uh, standard of living. One of the things that they did, for example, immediately upon reunification, uh, there were two currencies. There was the, the West German Deutschmark and the East German Deutschmark, and the, the East German Deutschmark was worth about a fifth, a fourth or a fifth of what the West German Deutschmark was on world markets. And there was a decision made at the very beginning, we will honor uh, East German Deutschmarks at, at, a, at a parity, one to one. Right. So suddenly, all the holdings that all these East Germans had were now worth four to five times as much as what they'd been worth before. The money supply basically gets really big, right? Because you're adding in to the existing stock of West German Deutschmarks a whole bunch of East German Deutschmarks, where they've been running the printing presses and printing lots of these things. That's why they weren't worth very much. You suddenly add these in, and you get inflation. Okay, and the Germans hate inflation. Okay. Uh, so those types of issues really worry, I, I would suspect, worry, worry the policymakers, right, which is, you know, what do we do about this transition period? Are we going to provide the safety net? Can we afford to provide, you know, a minimal safety net like East Germany, uh, like Germany did to the East Germans? What do we do about money? How do we introduce a new currency, right? All those things are sort of practical issues that you have to worry about uh, in that transition period. And... Uh, like I said, it's a good thing the policymakers get paid for doing it because I don't want to really think about uh, having to come up with all those answers by myself. Okie doke.